if there's an interventionist God, absolutely no way that he's benevolent or mm-hmm. he, they, she, whatever. Either there's You're a right, God-, God is a they, she. Yes. Yes, <laughs> and she's evil. <laughs> In 2017, Universal Studios announced the birth of a new shared universe of monster movies, bringing their classic horror icons into the contemporary franchise film landscape. Time to break some But after the critical and financial failure of its first installment, the project was indefinitely abandoned. Now, in 2024, the powers that be have called upon one pulp horror devotee and one snarky film critic to unearth the concept. I'm Dylan Roth. And I'm Dalton DeShane. Are you afraid of the dark universe? We hope you are now. Yeah. Uh, uh, welcome, anyone who's still listening to the podcast at this point. Uh, this is Are You Afraid of the Dark Universe? This is us preemptively assuming you're really mad at us. But may, you, maybe you're not. You're probably I mean, not. You've always been you're very. You've not. always been very patient and understanding with us as storytellers and trying to understand like that we have to sometimes do... Uh, it's, it's it's these are horror movies in in a sort of superhero structure. We We've have to occasionally worse. do some uh, really awful stuff with our characters in order to get a story to a place where we can have some catharsis. Also, we don't know exactly what we've done yet. That's we are, right. This, we have not written. So you're tuning in right now to the planning episode. If you're a veteran of the show, you're familiar with what we do here. Uh, but if, if for some reason not, this is an early one, if you are not a veteran of the show. This episode does contain many, many spoilers for the Dark Legion Death's Door, which is our Infinity War-like crossover that just aired. Mm -hmm. So if you would like to hear that unspoiled, go back to maybe our Phase 3 recap, maybe just dive in right with Death's Door, but don't listen to this one because we are going to spoil things right off the top here. Yes, uh, because there are a couple things, unlike with uh, The Mummy's Hand, where we were entering with pretty much a blank slate, uh, what are we going to do for our next Dark Legion movie? Yeah. You and I have both been building uh, towards this as sort of like the climax of, in some ways, our entire story so far. And look, let's get it out of the way, uh, especially because it's going to feel good to say it out loud, finally. Everybody dies. Yeah, this is the party wipe. Everyone dies except Nick and Dracula, who will be human, mortal, as Death's Door opens and we unleash Hell on Earth. Uh, this is an idea you came up with all the way back in House of Dracula. When we made Dracula mortal, mm-hmm. I think even before, like after we had shut off the recording for the House of Dracula planning episode, you pitched an idea that when we get to our sort of equivalent to mm-hmm. Infinity War, that you want the only two people left who are capable of continuing the fight yep. to be our force of good and our force of evil, both powerless human beings. Yes. And so we have been drawing towards this point for so, almost the entire show. Yeah. So if you wonder why Carol died, why Victor died, part of it was I also wanted to go into this with a very slim core group of Dark Legion members. Jenny had to be there because Jenny is an OG from mm-hmm. the mummy. Uh, Jack had to be there because he's one of our phase one heroes you right. know uh gwen had to be there because we had killed larry but we need at least one wolf person we weren't going to go into this with no werewolves yeah hunter to represent black lagoon and just because it was nice to have one non-og member sort of sure, around but they, but they are more than any other character that we've created since the big since house of dracula yeah Hunter is in the crew. Hunter yes. is a true, Hunter is essential. Yeah. A true Dark Legionnaire as much as anybody else. Victor, however, I knew I had to go because Victor doesn't start as a member of the Dark Legion. Mm-hmm. Victor, if we remember House of Dracula, was on Dracula's side. Right, he's the he, muscle for the villain. He really only joins at the end of the film. And so when I was thinking like core group for Dark Legion, even though Frankenstein is, is one of the you know, OG Universal Monsters, I didn't think he should be part of the Dark Legion for this. And then because he is an OG, it gives us a special chance to say goodbye to him yeah. earlier. I mean, that's the thing, is that we have so many characters who we want to give meaningful deaths. Yeah. You can't do all of that in the space of one movie. It also would make it feel sudden. This way, we've ramped up to it. I kicked off the phase by killing off Evelyn, a yes. character that we had just gotten back. Yeah. Right? Um, to, to signal that we're not just going to pile up new characters and that we were going to start tying up some loose ends. Her death and the great failure of potentially 
the what appears to be the destruction of heaven itself. Mm-hmm. That is the beginning of at least my feeling of what I wanted to do with phase three, which is the slow death of hope mm-hmm. that then here uh, significantly quickens. Mm-hmm. And people also were understandably very upset when Carol died. Yeah. Um, and I had people being like, you shouldn't kill, you know, uh, a queer woman on the show. Like, that's too much of a trope, you know, like of treating queer women or queer characters as disposable. I did it because I knew everyone was going to die. Mm-hmm. And killing Carol in Love Never Dies gives her a more special death. Yeah. It, I knew that Carol is one of our most beloved characters. And to give her a death in her own movie where sh- hers is the sole tragedy, actually, I thought elevated her right. death beyond just like if she dies among other character deaths. Especially in hindsight, now you will know that this is like, oh, no, no, we're we're killing off everybody. We're not yeah. just killing off, you know, the lovable, the lovable lesbian who's yes. everyone's favorite. We're not. We're, and, and we're not just, you know, even going back to we killed off Larry, obviously we had a specific story reason why we mm-hmm. why we ended up, you all probably heard that conversation where we made that determination, but we knew at the end of the day, everybody's going. Yeah, everyone except Nick and except Dracula, for, who, are guys, <laughs> who are white guys. Who are white guys. But if we were playing the metagame here, there is sort of the idea that we decided at the beginning that we were going to treat him as our anchor. Yes. Our anchor being, if you just saw... I have Dead not seen it yet. Wolverine. I don't know what that means. Yeah, you know, I, it I mean, know. what it means is nothing, Dalton. Okay, because uh, nothing in that movie means anything. I, but, I honestly, oh god, I really liked Into the Spider Verse, but I don't like people talking about canon events and anchor like the multiverse lingo is. Just, yeah, anyway, that's well, neither here. Nor something there. we'll get into perhaps in the later day. On but a bonus app. Now we each came into this planning session with different notes, kind of playing to our strengths as writers. Well, and. Before we get to that, the things that we had that we've had figured out ahead of time, things we've been working That's up right. to. We knew everyone would die except Nick and Dracula. We knew that the movie would end with Dracula emerging from death's door. I decided that it would I just told you after Van Helsing that it would be to kill Van Helsing. Yeah. Um, which hopefully that's still what happened. Maybe we pivoted at some point. But yeah, so we knew we spent all of phase three building our Dracula post credits so that he could walk through the door at the end of this movie. Yeah. And it would mean something. And it would mean something, and it would be him and Nick. And we knew that Death's Door would open and unleash hell on earth. That- right. And that when this new status quo that we've been exploring in our four sort of clean slate palette cleanser movies. Movies, yeah. would be a world in which like the dead were rising from the grave and ghosts or maybe not just technically ghosts will figure ex- out exactly what that means for us. Yes. They're now walking the earth. They're among us. Everything is fucked. Yeah. And if you, I'm, I, I assume I'm going to make sure that we said this in the dark Legion episode. The big news of course also is that hell on earth, dark Legion four will be ending the story of these characters yeah. in, with the dark universe. Uh, these characters' stories will not continue. Uh, Maybe one or two exceptions. Right. Maybe. Maybe. But the idea is, and I'm sure I'll have probably used this phrase before, but it's a thing that has been going through my head Mm -hmm. basically ever since we decided what we were going to do with Phase 4, and it's made me feel really... I, I really like that we're doing what we're doing. I think that all great stories have a single thing in common, and it's that they fucking end yeah i think that one of the things that is making movies feel more gray less memorable less Mm -hmm. special over time is the idea that like in comics the form that both tv and movies have now grown to emulate because Mm -hmm. of the decade-long uh monopoly of marvel over the box office the characters you love will always come back always come back and you know what more than and it's not just a matter of you can't trust when a character a character's death to matter or something like that because sometimes the death sticks worse than that you cannot count on anyone's happy ending mm-hmm. sticking because in 20 years, you need to bring them back for a story. And you know what? That character is going to need to have a reason to be there. Otherwise, it's otherwise it's, they're just set dressing or they're, they're just yeah. an attraction. And so you have to have it be that, oh, well, you know, Han and Leia, they got divorced, man. <laughs> uh, and Han's been just going through this midlife crisis for the last 20 years. Yeah. And even though I like The Last Jedi... People were, up. I I kind of get the idea. People were upset like, oh, Luke just kind of fucked up everything and has now been living on a hermit in a mountain and trying to trying to disappear and slowly die. It's like, yeah, that's the consequence of you wanting Luke Skywalker to come back. Yeah. Okay. There had to be conflict. That's what fucking happens. Yeah. So now this is really kind of funny considering we just talked about, we just just viciously murdered most of our characters. But (laughs) the idea is, 
I don't think I'm talking outside of school that whatever happens in hell on earth, I want there to be an ending that my, my goal here with Death's Door is for this to be such a low, to be so crushing mm-hmm. that we earn whatever catharsis, however big a however big an ending we want to shoot for in hell on earth, we will have earned it by how fucking far down we have dug so that any victory, whether it, whether it be uh, at whatever scale we choose, and of course, you know I have ideas, but I'm trying yeah. to say that it will feel like, no, no, it has to, it has to be that. Yeah. Um, we've spent all phase three digging these holes yes. with uh, Evelyn's death and Gwen killing her family. Yeah, we dug a lot of literal Carol's, holes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot of graves. Um, um, but uh, the things we don't know, we don't know our, we haven't figured out what exactly our plot is for this movie, like mm-hmm. what the driving plot is. We haven't figured out how they die or what their arcs are. All we know is the thing we said that everyone is going to die except for we. We also know we rough. know who our villains essentially are going to be, hmm. or do we? Oh, you might have a twist have, in mind for me. I have okay, some well, certainly story. what we've set up, the expectation we will have created for the audience is that the antagonist of this film should be Aminet, mm-hmm. right? Because we just spent three movies bringing her out uh, into the world, and she does not really get to be the villain or a mate or uh, like a a principal exactly mm-hmm. in Van Helsing. She's a device in that movie, mm-hmm. so. It certainly seems as if Set and Aminette, the relationship that they have to, should have in some way had a huge effect on the world, but mm-hmm. it has to be not so huge that it undercuts the hell on earth reveal at the end. Yes. Um, and that, that has to be, that failure has to be what leads to the deaths of the Dark Legion. As you've mentioned, you have Adelaide give that monologue in Van Helsing about how their inability to stop Set, their unwillingness to kill Nick is going to lead to them all watching one by one. You're going to watch the Dark Legion die. You told me off, Mike, that of course that that line is like, because of course it's exactly what's going to happen. Yeah. Right. Um, So I think that that feels like if you're going to be going in any other direction with the villain, that would be, I think, a a swerve you'd have to really sell. We're going to talk about it. Okay. Um, Well, I want to talk a little bit about preparation. Okay. Because you and I have done a little bit of uh, of chatting about this. We try to keep everything substantial here to the show so it can be part of the experience for the audience. But uh, a thing that we've kind of landed at is that just to, uh, I think that we're learning every time that we work together, right? Mm-hmm. About how to best work together as a storytelling team. I, and I think that what it comes down to is that I think that you have a, have a strong sense for plot and structure and escalation. Mm-hmm. And you will, and that's built sort of on the idea that, as you've said on the show, you believe that characters have to serve the story. Mm-hmm. Whereas I come at it from the opposite angle. And I think that the story has to all be, especially in an ongoing story where the characters are where the investment lies over a mm-hmm. long period of time. I think that the story has to be grown out of what you want the characters' arcs to be. Mm-hmm. And so, and I, again, I think this is one of the reasons why I think that our scripts that we write together are, are really strong and really cool is that yeah. we have to come up with a synthesis for that. So you have an idea of what the plot of this movie is. Mm-hmm. And I have a couple pages written down brainstorming where I think each character should begin and end the movie. Of course, the ending for most of these characters is fucking dead. But what yeah. is the what is the change that each of them has to undergo or fail to undergo to sort of complete their story in this film? Mm-hmm. Now, my hope is that that means that our notes are not going to clash very much. I hope so. Mostly what I've come up with is the engine that drives our plot and drives the escalation and what is going to ultimately be the cause of their death. Um, I also, uh, because I just came up with the idea in the shower and had to write it down, I wrote a cold open for this movie that I don't know if that ends up being our cold open, but you read it just before we started recording. Yes. Um, And it actually speaks very well to one of the things that I want to do. Which is great. I'm hoping that's the way the rest of this goes, but who knows? Maybe we'll have some disagreement. Maybe you'll hate the engine that I've come up with. Maybe. But But then we have this opportunity to shape in something we both like. One thing that we came up with sort of recently is realizing that because mostly our, our Dark Legion movies, have been in the Stephen Summers action horror mode because we have a team of heroes that need to prevent something, right? There is something threatening the world, Dracula, Imhotep, whatever. We have to stop it. And so they end up having a sort of action movie structure, which is uh, ends with a happy ending. And But here, we have decided everybody dies and our heroes lose, 
which naturally kind of gives us a horror movie structure. Mm -hmm. And that instead of being a Stephen Summers set piece romp, this could kind of be a slasher movie yeah. where our characters are actually on the defense instead of our characters being like, well, we have to find the staff of Osiris and we have to find this thing and we have to split up and go all over the world so that we can get the pieces that form the the, the Voltron that kills the bad guy. <laughs> it's no, we have people that we like that are now being hunted and they're being hunted down and killed. Who's going to be the final girl, you know, uh, and that allows us to also subvert expectations because it's not what people expect from these movies. But then what I'm realizing, the beautiful thing of a horror cinematic universe that had never occurred to me before, we have a slasher where nobody expects any of these characters to die and they already love them. Yeah. Normally you go into a slasher movie and you know, oh, everyone except the main character is going to bite it and I can all, I'm not getting attached to them right. because I know that these characters are all going to die horrible deaths one by one. Here, and you'll laugh, right? Yeah, a lot of times in a slasher movie, you have your, your they deserve, they got what they, yep. they got what Kate was coming to them kills, right? And then you have your more tragic ones. And then you have your cool, your cool final girl escape, perhaps revenge, right? Here, like none of these are going to feel good. We've set the precedent that our heroes win in the end and that there is like maybe one or two deaths in a Dark Legion movie. Ideally, our audience won't realize this is a slasher until halfway through. Yeah. And by then, they'll already have felt some things and then they'll feel the dread of, oh, oh shit, no. that means everyone's going. Yeah, like there's there's movies that accomplish this. Rogue One is great in this way. Yes. Rogue One is a movie where, uh, you know, you because of its place in the Star Wars canon, you have to wonder, okay, what happened to all these characters? Are we going to address it? Now, at this point, it's ballooned the universe to the point that you could believe that these people just wouldn't cross paths. But yeah. this is the first movie that they did that was not part of the Skywalker saga, right? Mm -hmm. They hadn't done all these TV shows. So there is sort of this lingering thing, a lot of people going in here, like, are these guys going to die? But you don't really believe that's going to happen until they start dying at the foot of that building. Yeah. Uh, and then you get towards the end of this and you realize, no, no, every single one of them is going to die. Yeah. And, uh, and they all have sort of a different purpose. There, I like that the deaths, uh, is the great message of that movie, my favorite thing about Rogue One is that it's about how uh, saving the world or uh, fighting a revolution or, or whatever requires just a little bit of sacrifice from everybody. Mm -hmm. And it is some of those, you know, all gave some, some gave all or whatever. Mm -hmm. But it is the kind of thing where like, no, there's not like, Luke Skywalker didn't destroy the Death Star by himself. All these people destroyed the Death Star. The guy who hands the, 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 the motherboard, the hard drive through that thing before he gets run through by Darth Vader, he saved the galaxy. Yeah. Every single one of them did that. That makes those deaths all feel really meaningful, even the characters you don't know. Here, we have all characters that we know. And so I think the interesting thing we have to do here is to somehow find a way to make each one of these deaths feel different. Mm -hmm. We need a mix of sort of heroic sacrifice deaths and completely miserable, senseless deaths. Yes. And I have an idea about how I want those distributed. Okay. Um, let's maybe first talk about who we have on the table and okay. who maybe each of us have been idealizing as our uh, ideal dark universe I think we have. I think we have pretty much the same list because we also talked about this a while back and I wrote it down. Okay. What do you have? My team, my protagonists here are Nick, Jenny, Gwen, Jack, and Hunter. That is also my list. Okay. Just today, I added Maria to the list. Okay. Just because... Oh, I'm not saying that she wouldn't even be in the movie, but the, in terms of our main characters. But she could be yeah. a main character. She, she has her own film, and she's, she's played by Janelle Monae. She's going to get killed off early, I think. Okay. I have a place for her, but it's the kind of thing like, if there's not room, we could probably write her out. But because she's so attached to Jack right now, we'd have to do like the Ocean's 12 thing of like, you know, uh, isn't it Ocean's 12 or where they're like the the wives aren't coming or something they like write julia roberts out you know no, she's like, in 12 because oh, they do the what? bit where they have to pretend that she is julia roberts is it 13 then i guess it's 13 it must be 13 I haven't seen them in a long time out. yeah they say something like she's not part of this yeah uh kind of like i did with hunter and van helsing <laughs> yeah um and there's another reason for that too that we'll get into more when i get into the plot machinations but yes we have basically the same team i like that as a very core team of five members mm -hmm. maria could stand in as like our sort of guest pitch surrogate of like new new fan favorite kind of person um but it's 
it depends on how things shake out. Sure. I mean, we're, we have a lot to accomplish. Yeah. Um, and there are reasons for us to keep some of our secondary characters alive, potentially, for uh, Hell on Earth. I also have, as a possible death order, mm -hmm. Jack first. Okay. Because it'll hurt the most. Um, and also, a lot of times in Dark Legion movies, we sometimes struggle for what Jack does. Yeah being non-powered but i think i think it's really just going to be the biggest gut punch right um, end of first act possibly end of first act yeah uh prove the situation is serious maria very quickly after that uh -huh. the, one of the reasons i have maria in here is i love the image of her waking up in bed next to a visible body mm. and being sh because jack that turns visible, turns visible when he dies yeah she wakes up and is frightened to see John C. Riley in right. her bed. Everybody has the terrifying thing of one day waking up, turning over, and your partner has just died overnight mm -hmm. in their sleep. Yeah. This is such a weird, specifically weird visual uh, version of that. Yeah. And I do like that. Joe Stando did have a, rec a suggestion as to how mm. it might be cool to have uh, uh, Nick die. Sorry, not Nick. Um, Jack die, which was to have it be in some sort of action context and Jack believes that he has just dodged some, some lethal attack. Mm -hmm. And he has sort of that, whew, I'm okay. And then he's gradually turning visible again. And the thing that tips everyone off to the fact that he's dying is they can suddenly, they're gradually being able to see him. And he doesn't know. And so there's sort of, it sort of has almost the reverse of the Mr. Stark, I don't feel so good thing. Yeah. Where he's appearing and that's what's so terrifying. We could maybe still do I think that. It, I, well, it might be, I mean, your thing, thing is that in a horror or drama setting, yours is like that kind of like, it's like unsettling to hear. Like that's upsetting me to hear about now. If we, depending on how dark the tone is at that point in the film, that might be too much. I think we can do both. Because in my plot version, I think Jack dies alone. Mm -hmm. And so maybe he's gradually turning visible and he doesn't realize it until he sees himself in a mirror or he sees himself in a reflection somewhere. And I think the the thing that kills him may just put him back in his bed for the effect of it. Mm. Um, but anyway, uh, Jack, Maria quickly after that, not really a reason to keep her around. And then we get down to more of a core, core four. Okay. Gwen, Gwen being a big escalation because she's the most powerful. Yeah. Hunter next, because Hunter is the key to a lot of our, mechanics right um, hunter has things that they need to do before they can die yes. in order to advance our larger story then we've talked about jenny and nick being the last two they end up going into the climax together yes jenny dies in the climax nick is alone until dracula appears yeah no objection to that okay all right now i taking a little peek at your notes here i can see that you have assigned each of the characters what appears to be uh someone to kill them yes so do it, let's the, here's my engine. Okay. Here's what I here's yeah. what I thought. Tell me, of give me the engine. spine of it, and I'll see if I can if I can wrap my character muscle around that skeleton. Uh, and if not, I might I might ask to break a few bones. So Set and Adelaide are together. Okay. Their goal is to open Death's door. We need to stall them until the end of the movie, right? Because that's got to be how the movie ends. Mm -hmm. Um. We have also introduced our death gods, in. Uh, in the mummy's in, hand. In the mummy's hand. But we only saw them in the Black Lagoon sort of reflected in a liminal space. Right. We got maybe silhouettes. We got voices. We don't have names. We know nothing about them individually. Set uh, had to be brought back by Aminette's ritual. My idea here is that Aminette and Adelaide slash Set are going around the world and waking up the various death gods. But that is not enough. Those death gods need to take a soul to be fully powered up. We need all of them to open the door. And all of them need to take not just a life, but a life that bears the mark of Set. The mark of Set are people that have been marked by Set himself, mm -hmm. who, as we remember, lived in Nick Morton. So they are people that Nick Morton has touched and come into contact with. They are, namely, the Dark, Dark Legion. Legion. And so each member of our Legion gets killed by a corresponding death god, which allows us to make every death unique by a unique force that we can come up with. The 
uh, so I have, for example, Jack gets killed by Satan, by the Christian. Like we're going, we, we start with like our classic Western Christian Satan who maybe manifests as like a goat as in the witch, uh-huh. you know, before becoming a monster with cloven feet or something. I have Gwen being killed by an Aztec god of death. Um, I'm trying to keep somewhat thematic, like regionally right. accurate. Okay. Not like super, because I don't want to get like into the politics of that, but like Gwen being Native American, uh, Aztecs being First Nations of the Americas. Yeah. You know, kind of okay. works. Uh, Maria is killed by an African god, Ogbunabali. I don't know how to pronounce these names yet. We We're going to figure them out. out. We're yeah. going to figure them out before the show. Uh, Hunter. Because Hunter is sort of our guardian of the River Styx, killed by Hades. Okay. Jenny is killed by Aminet because of their connection in the mummy. Nick is supposed to be killed by Set. But instead, Dracula comes and kills Adelaide. But because Set was bare in Adelaide's body anyway, it counts. She also bears the mark of Set because she has been host to him. And so they think they've staved off, that they've killed Set, and now the door can't open. But Set just takes another form. Adelaide bears the mark. The idea is that after everyone dies, the mark becomes visible on their body. So that will especially work with Jack being the first one. We'll see the mark on his visible chest. The mark, by the way, I found actually in... Uh, the Mummy 2017, there is a strange <laughs> symbol on the map that we see for a single shot. The map to set to, to Aminette's tomb. Something you imagine they would probably bring back later. Maybe, or it was just production design. Okay. They were like, there should be some cool Egyptian design on here. That's the mark of set. Um, and so we can even, if we want Aminette and set to be more of characters, we can follow them. But like part of the horror thing, as we talked about the mummy, our characters shouldn't have the upper hand at any point. They don't know that set and Aminette are coming for them. They don't know they're being hunted until maybe Hunter is the one that knows because the creature told them right. or something. But like, they don't know they're on their back feet, the whole movie. They're just figuring out how to survive while they're being hunted down by death gods mm-hmm. one by one in order for the door to open. Um, and that is sort of our, our structure and our plot engine. Okay. I think I can work with all of that with what I have. Um, now we have to figure out like what they're doing. Like, okay. Cause if, if we're following them, they still need to have like objectives, but I don't think the objective at any point is like, well, now we know how to close the door. All we have to do is find this thing. You know, it's like, how do we stay alive for another night? Right. How do we keep from getting killed in our sleep by another of these gods? Well, I think that there's a couple options there. Uh, I think the one question we have to answer is how much time has elapsed since the end of Van Helsing. Uh, Cause I would like there to be some, that that's that's something I don't even I don't know yet. But the longer we go, the longer it's like, why haven't set nominated? I don't want it immediately. To be, I don't want it to be action. like too long. But yeah. I mean, I don't want it to pick up immediately after. Okay, I need there to be some time for because here's the theme that I want to to play with here. I want this movie to be about um, this sort of dread that comes with feeling as if you've already lost and mm-hmm. that you have to just make do with whatever is left. A little bit about settling for a future you don't want. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought a lot about the idea of you know the whole the whole idea of there's just a hell right, which I think mm-hmm. is an introduction that you something that you introduced. Um, I can't remember yeah. which one of us came with it first, but I think that was you. But since that since that idea came in there, I was thinking a lot. You know, as we're as we're gradually making our way towards this uh, apocalypse, everything that I write is about climate change at the end of the day, right? But it's just you know it's it is the horror premise of our age, right? It is the doom that we all have to face day after day, trying to go about our lives, doing the tiny little things that we do Mm -hmm. that do nothing to prevent what's going to kill, if not us, then our uh, descendants, Yeah, right? And I think that as you get closer and closer to the point of no return, you start to imagine more and more compromised futures. And... In our reality, like the world's not going to end all at once, right? The future that my son is going to live through is going to be harder than the present that we're living now in a lot of ways, but he's not going to see humanity perish, most Mm -hmm. likely. It's just going to get a little bit worse and then a little bit worse and Mm -hmm. then a little bit worse for however however long it takes for us to kill each other, right? So 
I have been thinking a lot about this sort of countdown, and I have been uh, uh, derelict in getting to this in my stories. I keep trimming this stuff out. But since the revelation in the mummy's hand that hell's a coming, Mm -hmm. there is no other way out, right? I really want to explore the psychological effect that that has on people. In the past, we could maybe think it's just happening to, it's like, it's the crazy, hyperactive, hedonistic sex drive of the kids in uh, Kill Your Darlings. Or it's uh, the worship that people have for Evelyn as the last symbol of maybe salvation is still possible in um, Heaven's Gate, right? But now, we've reached the point where even our characters who know everything, who have been on, who well, not know everything, right? But who have mm-hmm. been on the head of it, who have been staving off the apocalypse, they have just completely fucking blown it. And they are no, they are beginning to lose faith that they can possibly win. Um, and I want that to be why they lose. Um, a few things. Mm-hmm. One thing, because I don't think I've ever said this on the air, but the idea that everybody on earth knows that all there is is, in, is hell is actually an idea I've never really liked. And I didn't know that was the plan, I think, until you made it, maybe made it canon in something. I always thought that Cassie's book and the Manaus incident would make it clear that, like, demons are real and monsters are real, but not necessarily the revelation that everyone goes to a hell because part of me thinks that's kind of world-breaking. Well, like, I don't kinda, think everyone would believe it, for like, one thing. I, I think, like, the revelation enough of seeing demons on television is sort of enough to give us that effect that we want of, like, wow, the entire world is changing is a lot worse than we thought it was, and stuff like this can just happen, I mm-hmm. guess, is kind of a big enough thing. But I think that that cat's out of the bag. I think we've made it canon in some episodes that everyone knows that it's only hell, I also don't know that Cassie would even include that in the book because of how like world breaking it is. And it's something that's not necessary to tell the story of the dark Legion up to that point. Well, let's say that that that's not even super something that we need to fuss over for this one, because we're just focusing. I think we need to focus in on these characters now, but I want the idea. I want, I want these characters to all be facing all the failures that they have, uh, that they have uh, participated in or caused over the past phase and have that terror that we have been able to put off because they have had little victories. They did beat Imhotep. They did beat mm-hmm. Dracula, right? Yeah. But as we've talked about, even all the way back to when Dracula was trying to become the god of death, mm-hmm. he was, at the end, begging the Dark Legion not to stop him because it was going to get worse. Yeah. And so I, I think that it's going to be dawning on them here that maybe they haven't accomplished anything. And it's too late. I think we can do that without a too big of a time jump. I kind of think maybe what happens when each of these death gods is awoken one by one, there is some sort of like biblical plague that happens in that region. Like Like that. that there is a mass death. And so we start with our characters shortly after Van Helsing being like, what do we do? We have to do something. And then they turn on the news and it's like 3 million dead in South America. Mm -hmm. And it's like, fuck, we're too late. And then it happens again. And then it happens again. Yeah, it's all these things that are going to make what they didn't let happen to Cairo look like a picnic. Exactly. And so they they keep having to be like, we have to stop the next one. Mm -hmm. And they're always too late. And not only that, those three million dead aren't even enough. It has to be one of them that dies. Like that's yeah. just that's just the consequences of these guys being awoken. But in order to open the door, Jack needs to die. Gwen needs to die. Hunter needs to die. Mm-hmm. And so they're racing to try to not just stop the deaths of all these people, but also themselves. Yeah. And they're always too late because they can't get ahead of two literal gods. Yeah. And yeah, that all their all the choices they refuse to make are now minuscule in comparison to what's happening right in front of their eyes that they can't s- stop. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so here's where I think each character is with this. We've established Nick as a character who the things that we really know about him. His first, his worst fear, in consistently, is not death. It's failure. Yeah, it's failing the people that he loves. It's failing to. It's it's being the last one left. Yeah, we've built yeah. up to that pretty well. Yeah, his fear is being the last one left, which he will be. Right. Yes. Um, but that, to I, the point where, like, he's like, if I have to sacrifice myself in Van Helsing just yeah. so that my friends are okay, 
I would prefer that. Yeah. And you know what? I think that there will be some remorse there of like, I should just let them kill me. I don't know why I didn't do that. Yeah. Right. But now, you know, he feels like that ship, that ship has sailed, right? Nothing mm-hmm. is now, 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 now nothing is gained from his death. So yeah. now he has a reason to live in that way. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think that one of the things that's happening for him is I want to have him maybe considering that there might not be a lot of life left. Maybe I want to spend what I have left trying to rekindle things with Jenny, the mm-hmm. original love interest, which is a good angle because A, it feels logical. B, they're both hurting really bad. And C, the audience won't like it. <laughs> uh, it will feel wrong, right? Yeah. Because they have grown to this different relationship. It will feel like settling because it is, mm-hmm. right? But that's what's left. What's left for them is, if I can't save the, maybe we can't save the world. Maybe I lost my chance to save the world. And now all I have to, all that matters to me right now keeping my friends, especially Jenny, alive because that's all, that's what's left. What I can do now, I can't, I can't put the end of the world. What I can do is try to make something out of whatever little life I have left. Just squeeze out just a little bit of joy, just a little bit of joy and a little bit of love from this miserable, doomed existence. And he's going to lose that. Which is perfect because the cold open I wrote flashes yes. back to when they had sex. I was very pleased to read that. The idea that we're starting from the beginning of their relationship and his initial transgression against her that fucks everything up because the entire, the entire thing for him he was sleeping with her for at, at, out of the uh, gold to steal his map, right? Yeah. It's the little perk of this little scheme that he's doing, right? Yeah. Um, and now he's a different guy and she's a different person too. And now they have a love for each other, which I know we're supposed to believe that they fell in love during the mummy, but I, I you know, I don't remember. No, we, we've uh, never as, followed. Yes. Because um, <laughs> we didn't but, believe it. But we know that there were still some feelings there. We, we refer to it in our House of Dracula script. I think that, you know, Nick had his heart broken losing Evelyn uh, Jenny is completely devastated losing mm-hmm. Carol. So the thing here is that Nick is like, he wants, he's still, he's still fighting the good fight. He's still mm-hmm. doing the thing. But in the back of his mind, the thing is like, what really my real, my objective here is the, the, the thing that I really just can't let happen is I can't lose Jenny. Mm-hmm. Um, especially after, especially if we, if we lose Jack first, yeah. his best friend. Yeah. It's like, this is, this is all, this is the whole world to me now. Yeah. It's just Jenny. Uh, and Je- on Jenny's side, I think that, of course, she does She does love Nick, even mm-hmm. if it's not the kind of love that she had for Carol. But Jenny doesn't believe that she deserves to be happy. And there's also probably some guilt because she spent the last movie trying, trying to, to get ki- him killed. Sure, but like there's there's guilt for her. Her whole thing is guilt now, right? Yeah. She failed. She's, she feels responsible for the death of her wife. She then tried to kill her friend, uh, who which would maybe, it's a very confusing feeling, she could have saved the world by killing her friend. Mm-hmm. Uh, she eventually chose not to do it, right? It uh, makes sense for them to have a very toxic, doomed romance. Yes, right it's now, gonna be a very, messy and weird, yeah, and it's going to make them romance. Yeah, it'll make them both. It'll make them both unhappy. But again, if you're them, what the, what the fuck else? What time is left for them to find anything else? And in retrospect, this makes me happy that I didn't hook up Jenny and Adelaide because yeah. that would have felt like too much. So that would yeah, we couldn't like, do both. Nick needs to be her rebound. Yes, and I think. The cold open I wrote kind of ends on that comedic note of him running away with the map. Mm-hmm. I feel like we should go to the title card and then come right back up on Nick and Jenny together, morose, maybe holding each other, like yeah. having an intimate moment, but it's no longer kind of funny. There's no fun. There's nothing funny there's, about it. Yeah, there's nothing fun. There's nothing funny. There's no joke. This this uh, might be the first script ever where I think I might want to include like no jokes. Uh, we'll see. We might we'll really see. need them, right? We, we, I think it's always appropriate to have at least a few, especially f- from Jack before he dies. Like, sure. you know. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely going to be tonally very different. All right. So that's where I have uh, Nick and Jenny. Yes, that I, feels like I, the worst for you. I like that a lot. I couldn't believe. You know, I was thinking. Uh, part of this was like I, I was thinking back to the Mummy, and I was realizing we've made Nick and Jenny so important. We've never had the flashback to that meeting. Yeah. Like we've we've never gone to like the the prelude to the mummy 2017 and now felt like the perfect time to do it to like flash back to this simpler time. Yeah. I mean, this is the time to do it. Right. Uh, so I think that for Jenny, yeah, she, she's, she remains extremely goal oriented. She's, she's amassed this power. I think for the most part, I think that Jack is the only one who believes they can win at the beginning of the movie who really fully believes it. Yeah. For Jenny, it's just simply a matter of, I have to do it. Yeah. This is my fault and I have to fix it. They all think it's their fault mm-hmm. and they're all kind of right. That's the problem. Yeah. Right. So, you know, Jenny will um, finally maybe come around to accepting that she's not a terrible person just in time to die at the end of the movie. Yeah. Um, I think that that's that's I want all the deaths to feel a little bit different. I want for hers to be like, maybe I'm not a villain. Maybe I'm not the worst. And then that eh, doesn't matter. And she dies at the hands of Aminette, 
yeah. who only exists because she gave her soul to Carmilla yeah. at the cost of Carol. So she's like, reaping. It's, it's, the, it's she's closing reaping. the loop of yeah. her greatest failure. Yes. Um, I kind of would like her to get some some last little line. I, oh, sure. I think I would like her death not to be completely hollow. Here's one that I think is going to be completely hollow and it might surprise you. Mm -hmm. I think Gwen has given the fuck up. I think she's now full on doomer. Yeah. I think she's ready to die. I yeah. think that after what you put her through <laughs> and then after what she's just gone through. Yeah. I think she's fucking done. I want Gwen to be my portrait of we have taken this idealist who was going to who initially thought she didn't have the power to save the world. Mm -hmm. Then she acquired the power to maybe save the world. And then she became part of a system that had some of the same priorities, but then made some choices that, that just made things worse. And now these fucking boomers have been unable to give up a thing that they like. In this mm -hmm. case, not in terms, not necessarily, you know, um, their stock price going up or whatever. But in this case, it was something much harder to give up, which is the people you love, right? But she's like... At every turn, Nick and Jenny and Jack, they fucked us mm -hmm. for self for out of out of selfish reasons. And I have this idea of there's being this exchange between Jack and Gwen, where Jack is like, "Well, what have you? What would you have done if you had to choose between protecting the world and someone you love?" And Gwen can just be like, "We'll never know because everyone I love is dead." Yeah. And so I think she's just a complete. She's gone into full on doomerism now. And she's just she's just waiting for the end because what's left, which I think what's, maybe gives us an opportunity because she's our most powerful character. Yeah, to literally give up. Yeah, like that. Like maybe as an alpha wolf, maybe even this death god, mm -hmm. they like kind of they're an even match. But at the end of the day, she decides, you know what, I'm going there anyway. Yeah, you know uh, what else am just, I getting into? And just you know, lets it happen. Yeah. Um, uh, and I think that there's a, a way that we can reflect that, tra that tragedy in something you sort of infer about the relationship with Charlie and where that's gone in Van Helsing, which is that I think that Charlie really loves Gwen. I think that Charlie could potentially be a really good thing for Gwen. Mm -hmm. uh, Charlie is not a rebound. Charlie is a, a shot at something real. Yeah. And I think that Gwen just can't see it. She's just too, she's just too far gone. And, and that, that, and that's destroying her relationship. Or yeah. The idea of her loving someone is just a setup for her yeah, to lose. She doesn't get hurt. Yeah. She, she, she was, she was tricked into killing her entire family right after she lost her boyfriend, her first mm -hmm. like serious boyfriend that we know of. And then her sort of surrogate family member, right? Somebody mm -hmm. who she attached to whose life she had positively changed through her actions as a werewolf. He's gone now too. Yeah. What's left? fucking it's over you lost and she and, and unlike nick who's like okay maybe it's over but i can maybe find a little bit of solace in what time is left she just she she's just too hurt she's too far gone and it's fucking over yeah i like that and i like i like her basically yeah giving up and giving herself over to hell um because like also for gwen like on the plus side that's where everyone she loves is. Yeah. You know? I mean, whether or not, she doesn't know whether or not she'll actually ever see them. Sure. Right? But she knows they're not here and they're not coming back. Yeah. So it's just a, a matter of like, all this power, everything that we did, we've accomplished nothing and it's all just the same fucking mistakes that have been made by every fucking generation before me. I never really had my hands on the wheel. It was all over before. I even really got my hands on the wheel. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, a feeling that I think that a lot of millennials and Zoomers have. Yeah. Um. This is a fucking really depressing conversation, but this is this is this is this is where we've landed with our story, right? Yeah. Part three of four, everybody. <laughs> um, so I I think I mean Gwen is my is my surrogate a lot of time, and I've mm -hmm. I've I wanted to use her to explore both the good and bad changes in my life, and I think the lowest point that I have had as a person is having the feeling like why bother? It's over. Yeah. Like I've recovered from that point in my life. You know, that's one of the that's one of the things that led to becoming a parent is that I wanted mm -hmm. to invest in that future. I wanted to I wanted to have skin in the game. I wanted to believe in that future. And now I can look at my son and see what a just a beautiful ray of positive uh, positivity and light. You didn't want to be life. Ethan Hawke in First Reformed. Uh, yeah, I didn't want to be that. And I didn't want to be Clive Owen in Children of Men. That's the one yeah. that really, like, even though I haven't rewatched the movie in years, Children of Men is a movie that 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 convinced me. Like, no, I I want to believe there's a future. Yeah. Because once you decide that there's not, then there isn't. I I think Gwen will have reached that point. And I hadn't, it's not something that I had completely uh, thought of for her until we got to this point in the story. I was going through her arc, through the things that you did in phase three. And I'm like, 
No, she's the one who has to. It, 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 it means the most for it to be her because she was the most idealistic at the beginning. Well, she's kind of already on that ledge in Native American Werewolf yeah. when she's approached about the political stuff and she's like, ah, I'm not really interested because right. like she's just she's already like her her faith in her ability to change the world is shaken. Mm-hmm. And that's before she kills her whole family. Yeah. And now it's like all and before I've done, Victor dies, who she was close to. All I've done is make things yeah. worse. All any of us have done is make things worse. The world is not a better place with me in it. I, I think we need to have a scene with her and Charlie in this. Yes, oh, absolutely. I mean, I've written some stuff here. I Great. think I think that Charlie needs to be the character who is close enough to her, who has, who has seen this whole transformation. Mm-hmm. Or or maybe if we if she sees Gwen, she's been seeing Gwen's Gwen's decline. But maybe if they when they re when they meet each other again after Van Helsing, then this is maybe the first time that Charlie has been completely incapable of moving Gwen back. And I think before Gwen dies, I think that they actually break up. Mm. I think that Charlie basically has to be like, I can't, I can't be part of this. I have to, I want Charlie to be the example of maybe an unspoiled Gwen in this place. I can't live that way. It kills me that you have decided to live that way, but I can't do it. I don't care if there is no chance of saving the world. There's just no, there's just no way a person can live like that. And I'm not going to be a part of it. You can come with me and try to live our lives or try to keep saving the world, which is the woman that I met and fell in love with, Mm -hmm. or I need to leave or you need to leave because this is not working. And on that note, and then, yeah. (laughs) With half of our Dark Legion uh, theoretically killed, let's take an AC break. Yeah. And head to a little, a little uh, uh, something, maybe a bonus pod clip or uh, I don't know where we're at in the schedule. This is in the future. Somebody tell a fucking joke. (laughs) Uh, And we'll be right back to plot to kill more of our uh, favorite characters. You get to see why we did it. (laughs) All right. Hey, everybody. Dalton DeShane here. I uh, hope everyone's having a great time listening to this feel-good episode. Uh, sorry it got a little dark there at the end of the first half. Um, but look, we're going to pick things up a little bit. We I didn't throw to this earlier because I didn't know it was going to happen, but my EP came out uh, just this past Friday. You, of course, have heard my single Hell Breaks Loose on a previous episode. Um, but now that the full EP is out, I wanted to play another song for you. And because the rest of this episode is so dark, I thought I'd pick the love song. Uh, it's a love ballad that closes out the EP uh, called Supernova. And so I'm going to play it here and then we'll get back to plotting uh, Death's Door. If you like this, the EP is called Bodies for the Geek Pit Part 1. That's Bodies for the Geek Pit Part 1 uh, by Dalton DeShane and the Traveling Show. You can get it on streaming services everywhere uh, or on Bandcamp for pay what you want. Uh, here is Supernova. I hope you all enjoy it. lion cub with ego to bruise to run away now once again lost in the wild set adrift in the sea this time the dark can't extinguish the star that will bring me back when i am supposed to be cause you and me when we meet twin goals
And we're back with more cheery talk here on... The thing is, this is fun. I like breaking stories like oh, this. Absolutely. And not all, not all movies are feel-good movies. Yeah, uh, this is going to be, I would imagine, our most feel-bad movie ever. Perhaps that we'll ever write. <laughs> um, but I do I do want it to be satisfying. Yes. I want it to have some, some cool shit that happens. Uh, and I want to talk about Hunter real quick. Let's talk about Hunter. I have a few uh, practical ideas for Hunter. I think Hunter especially gets brought into this because of the creature and the, you know, we've talked about the protection, the yeah. the rubies and emeralds and things that, that they're putting on people's uh, faces when they die. Uh, I think we um, will see more of that. Yes. But I think Jenny recognizes the mark of set because she knows it from the map. Mm-hmm. But maybe it's Hunter that puts together like the death gods are coming back, you know, Um but more importantly, I have an idea for the set piece of Hunter's death. Lay it on me. One of the harder things we've had to deal with in some of these is how to involve the Black Lagoon. And I've been thinking about that in regards to Death's Door. Mm-hmm. I think what would be cool would be whenever they're on the hunt of Hades, they end up in a place that the Lagoon is also at. And we get a chance to see, uh, what's her name? Uh, Xena. Right. Oh yeah, we didn't have a uh, uh, Lavelle. Yeah, we get Lavelle back. Hunter may be surprised to see her because they didn't know that the lagoon was there. And when the Death God comes for Hunter, we have a scene of them being chased because Hunter, human, powerless, mm-hmm. doesn't have anything to fight Hades with. So Hunter goes to where the lagoon is and runs for the lagoon and purposefully breaks open the egg sack ah to release the to release the the ferryman in order to fight the uh, yes so the ferryman is released and the ferryman tries to protect hunter and gets between them and we get a fight between hades and the ferryman that the ferryman loses and the ferryman dies because once death's door is open there's no need for a ferryman. Yep. No one's getting ferried. Layoffs. Living and death is the same thing at that point. There is no difference. Uh, and so Hades kills the ferryman and then Hunter. But I like the idea of releasing the creature into yeah. our world on purpose to act as Hunter's bodyguard. I like that. Yeah. Let's get into the action. I also yeah. like the idea that we can see the Black Lagoon collapse. We can watch it. We yeah. can watch it become, uh, we can watch it dissolve or break apart in some sort of nonsensical, uh, physically impossible way yeah. uh, when he's killed. The only conflict that it has with any idea that I had, which is that I kind of want, Hunter needs to know a little bit more than everybody else. Yep. Uh, and more than we're going to say here on the air. Yeah, because um, we've already established that. Yes. Um, and I think that I had the idea of Hunter not working necessarily with uh side by side with whatever the rest of the gang is doing and following their own quest so that we have limited information about it okay and then that quest coming to an end right after they've completed some important task they need to do whether it's sending one of their artifacts somewhere or or burying it with somebody or something like that that then there's a moment where they realize oh i'm about to die and the ferryman because of their proximity to the lagoon in this place or because they because they are one of the, the keepers of the lagoon or whatever, the ferryman has to, even though they're not the one killing, he's not the one killing Hunter in the physical world, just like with, um, I've lost his name, uh, Titus Welliver's character. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 Fans are screaming at their phones right now. Yeah, why well, can't, I wrote, I've written this fucking We've script written a lot so of many times. But just uh, like, just like that character, the previous one, and also with- Nestor. Yes, and with Willis in my re- re- Return to the Black Lagoon, mm-hmm. um, Hunter has that same moment where they realize that they are about to experience death as it is done by, you know, as performed by the ferryman in this sort of like, It's not technically what's killing them, but it is just like with Nestor, they experience it through the lens of being killed by the ferryman. And the thing that makes Hunter's death different is that Hunter's like, it's okay, I'm ready. I've done what I need to do. And it sort of becomes like a merciful or tender moment. But that is the same moment Nestor has. That's true. Nestor has the same kind of tender like, you know. Yeah, and then Willis kind of has that too, right? But I, I don't know if that, I think that that's one of those things where George Lucas voice, it's like poetry, it's like they rhyme. Or I might just be trying to think, I mean, certainly that makes for a less interesting 
like action opportunity than setting the ferryman loose. Uh, but I'm trying to find ways. My thinking was trying to find ways for each of these deaths to have a different tonal impact on the film. In, in, in both in order to keep variety if, and also so it doesn't just become exhausting to listen to or watch. What if both the ferryman and Hunter are mortally wounded mm -hmm. by Hades and they're on the ground sort of next to each other. Right. And Hunter says, no, I want it to be you. Like Hunter doesn't want to die from Hades. Hunter, right. Hunter has wanted it to be the creature. And, and so, so the, maybe like, all right, so maybe Hunter is about to basically choke on their own blood. Yeah. And so that's literally what's happening. But we have the ferryman sort of limply just kind of put their hand over their mouth and hold their nose shut, right? Or so that's, just... They're technically... So it's sort of like that's... that's cause I, If I'm understanding the Black Lagoon properly, it's... Like, unless the ferryman is released, right? Which I guess in this case, he has been. Yes. We are seeing magical manifestations of what that death looks like for the ferryman. But in actuality, this person has just been shot or stabbed or drowned, right? Yes. Um, yes, you are right. But now the ferryman is out. Okay. So it's different. But so what if hunters like choking on their own blood, the ferryman puts a hand on their chest and the blood turns to black sludge. Right. I like that better. And they, they choke on that. And then the ferryman puts the same things over Hunter's eye. Yes. Completes the loop. Completes the loop. Okay. Before they both die. But then we kind of get to have both. We get our action scene, but Hunter can be like, no, I've known that when I die, it's supposed, it's supposed to, be to be you. you. Yeah. And closes that loop. The creature puts the things on their eyes and mouth. They both die. The, the creature maybe dissolves and whoever's left, which it sounds like maybe it's just Jenny and Nick, find yeah. Hunter with the things over their eyes. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Dead. We're left with one sort of uh, just the order of operations. If we want Jenny to have those, we need to make sure that that's possible too. I don't think Jenny does. Okay. Because Carol does. Okay. All right. That answers that question. Um, okay, so that's cool. I... And Gwen doesn't either, right? Well, I was thinking so that... So do we kill Hunter before Gwen? Uh, no, Gwen does need to have them. That's important. Oh, yes, be yes, yes. Uh, particularly right. because Larry doesn't. Yes, yeah, okay. Leap that out. <laughs> um, so yeah, okay, so that's... that's uh, the last thing that I have here is about Jack, and I don't have any particular... We already talked about the ways he might die. Uh, and he's going to die early, so he doesn't have much early. time for a character. Yes, but so uh, and that's actually convenient because I want his thing to be that he's kind of the most himself. Because even though everything terrible has happened with Jack, Jack almost made. I think Jack is the one who, uh, who feels as if not following his instincts actually made things worse. I think that he's yeah. the one who's like, no, it, I think if we had killed Nick, that this all would still have happened. We yeah. just would be worse. Like he believes in the moral of that film. Yeah. He's the one who most believes it. And so he's most resolved to not lose his way and to stay himself. He's the one of all of them who believes we're still going to win and we're going to win by, by being who we are mm -hmm. and by fighting for what's right. Which of course means his dying first makes yeah. everybody lose faith in that immediately. Yeah, he is the last hope. Yes. So, uh, so his is the easiest thing, right? We have to establish that like he's we could go the route where he's just absolutely racked with guilt. Like we did just see him after the death of Victor the last time we saw him and he was a complete wreck. Mm -hmm. But I think he comes, I think he's been through this a number of times. I think he comes yeah. on the other side of that feeling like, no, you know what? We're the Dark Legion. This is what we do. Mm -hmm. We faced this before. We're gonna keep fighting. God damn it, I'm in love <laughs> with someone who loves me for who I am for the first time in my life. I'm not giving this up. Yeah. We're gonna fucking win. We're gonna do this. And then he dies. Yeah. Uh, that's all I have. I, yeah, I think that works. I think Maria dies very shortly after. Uh huh. Um, because yeah, they're kind of they're kind of tied together. I I, I might want to play that one by ear because I think that I don't know. It feels a little, it feels a little wasteful. It feels a little bit. I, I don't I don't like treating her like an appendage, especially yeah. since um, I mean we've cast a big name actor and we haven't gotten to explore her very much in our texts yet. Yeah. Uh, and much like you know I I'm. I'll admit I'm a little bit raw about like we didn't kill off Esmeralda in Hunchback and then it doesn't look like she's going to do anything again. 
You know, it's that kind of thing where it's yeah, like, well, if we're going to have a character we around, I would like I would like her to function as her own. Like, this is theoretically a character who has had her own film, right? Yes. So we've we could, adopted that. That's an arcane. We could now. keep her around as like, she's the character that, uh, one thing I've, I've had in mind is like, when she finds out that she's also marked, she can be like, Wait, why am I part of this? I'm not. I'm not part of your legion. Like mm-hmm. I don't have anything to do with this. But she's kind of after Jack's death. She's kind of inadvertently drawn into it because just because she's marked. So now right. she's also fighting for her life the same as everyone else. And she, uh, so she becomes a part of the legion just by necessity. She can continue to play that role that you have her play in Van Helsing, where she's sort of the outsider who, yeah. who can see things a little bit differently. So we can keep her longer. I'd we like can keep, keep her, her a little bit longer. Yeah, I mean, like around. they're all going to go. Yeah. Um. I, I also think, you know, I just, I don't like to be wasteful about it. If we've sure. got, we've got these characters, especially the people who we like, you know, if we're ending their stories here. We, I, I, I'd like to make sure that we, that we feel like that. I, Right now, it feels like because she just dies as a consequence of Jack dying, that this is a character whose death won't feel like anything. If we're keeping I, her around, then yeah, I think we keep her around for a while. I agree, and we actually she's because Jack was our one hope. Mm-hmm. Maria is the person that carries his flame from the beginning of the movie to the end, yeah, and gives it to Jenny. Yeah, uh, like she's the one that has like a heart to heart with Jenny before she dies that brings Jenny to the end of her arc. And I she's, like that. she kind of, yeah, she keeps Jack's little bit of hope a lot. Even if she doesn't believe it for most of the movie, by the end, she's like, Jack was right. Yeah. And Jack believed in you. Mm hmm. And so I believe in you. I, I really like okay, Here's the thing, because obviously we've talked about it. Maria's had a horribly traumatic life, right? You think she thought she was going to find love and happiness yeah. and acceptance ever again? No, right? She's been through, in terms of calendar years of misery, more than any of these characters. Yeah. So I think there's the thing where, like, she's her carrying the torch is not going to mean the same thing to the other characters for a while because they don't really mm. know her, right? Yeah. It's not like having Jack, and they yeah. just lost Jack. And she's also a reminder that they just lost Jack. The so, only but, person that knows her at all really is Jenny because yeah. they were both on Team, on team Van Helsing. Yeah. yeah. So, and that also, and that makes it really work that she's the one who finally reached out to Jenny at the end. Yeah. But I like the idea that then it's, it's, uh, she can carry that torch the whole time, but th- it doesn't mean the same thing to them until they feel like they've been through this journey together mm-hmm. and they can see what Jack loved in her. Yeah. Right. And they can see her in him in that way where you can see, you know, you, you see the people who you see people who love each other reflected in each other, right? Yeah. In the way that they affect each other. And so, uh, yeah, I would really like to keep her around. I'd like her to be that foil, especially since like we won't have that side of the sort of emotional pyramid uh, yeah. after Jack is killed. I do like the idea of her playing that role for a little bit. Yeah. And then, and then that gives her death meaning a little bit later where it's like, no, she carried this. Yeah. I like the way that you put it, that she carries that torch. She... And then she carries it just long enough to pass it on to another character who the audience should reasonably assume is going to then carry it out to the end. But she doesn't get to. So we need Jack to die first. Yeah. Then it seems like we need Hunter to die second. Maybe. And then Gwen. Okay. And then Maria. And then Jenny. Okay. Now, maybe we get Hunter, maybe the thing that gets the, the gang together again again is another fucking funeral I, I, I don't know or if, if we're gonna go close to Van Helsing then we can skip the part where they all have to get the game back together because they're already back together and that might just be efficient yeah yeah and that's they, the thing is like I, I want to keep momentum going yeah especially because we we pulled a lot of triggers at the end of Van Helsing mm-hmm. I guess I should say I pulled a lot yeah. of triggers at the end of Van Helsing yeah <laughs> sneaky devil basically doing one of these without me that's fine I'm, I'm not, sorry I don't I don't feel at all uh, at all bruised <laughs> Well, so, now, we're, and now we're doing now we're doing this one. Yeah. Another thing that I would like in this movie, I think one of our big set pieces should take place in New York City. Yeah. You know what? We haven't done a big New York City we set haven't piece. Been we've New done York stories City. that, well, I mean, like we did you know, Phantom of the Phantom and Jekyll X Hyde were both here, but neither of them True. had a big city like, you know, like we stayed we, on Broadway. We haven't done our Avengers climax. Yeah. Right. If we're ever going to do that, now is a pretty good time. Yeah. I think something should take place here. My other question. So let's talk about Aminet and Set. Yep. Because yes, there are big bads. My whole thing of like, oh, well, I don't know if they're the big bads because I do want these other death gods involved. Mm-hmm. But I think Aminet and Set are the big bads of three and four. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Dark Legion 3 and 4. Yeah, I know what you mean. So, like, we can take our time to have these Death Gods doing the killing, but do we want to give give us more time with Adelaide and Aminette to sort of follow them around as they're awaking these various gods? I just don't know what the interest is in just sort of seeing them hit the... This is where I can play a little bit more of my mythological stuff that I started seeding in Heaven's Gate. Okay. Where I can have a start to... There's a lot of stuff that I've implied or that you and I have talked about or maybe Mm -hmm. it's even been talked about a little bit like not in the scripts about the nature of this world that I think has been simmering long enough that I'm ready to make some of it text. And I think that there are a vehicle through which to do it. Yeah. Uh, Because I think I like the idea like uh, that set has been here from the beginning. And I mean the beginning, beginning, right? Aminette, uh is a human, right? Mm-hmm. Or she was. Um, and she has this relationship with Set, which I guess is was began as this pact and evolved into this love, right? That simmered over centuries. And now she still doesn't know everything, right? And so she's potentially a character who can be our sort of receptacle of knowledge. Um, and But in this sort of, because it's the villain and not and not the hero, we can get just the little bits and pieces of, of lore through their actions, through maybe the methodology that they use to, to get these other gods. Uh, I have a little bit... Uh, I have a lot of, like, the, 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 the engineering mm-hmm. of the relationship between hell and heaven and earth and stuff mm-hmm. in my head and in my notes that I think I could... I, can, I have a place where I can use some of it here. Not too okay. much. Yeah, the, the tricky part I, I'm realizing is that because this is our horror movie, I want to go as long as possible without us knowing exactly what's happening here. Right. You know, like I want these forces to be, I want people to be like, what the fuck just killed Jack? Uh Uh-huh. Where did it come from? You know, like I don't want people to know exactly what our various death gods are, what they're, why they're being awoken or, you know, like maybe Hunter, Hunter knows, but dies before they tell everyone everything. Right. You know? Um, All right. Well, let me share some of this with you here and we can cut it out of the episode. I think it's too much. My feeling here is my, my kind of uh, grand mythology is that, so hell is its own where hell comes from. We don't know. It's as, you know, it's as ancient and mysterious as our universe, Mm -hmm. but it is a place where these beings of pure cruelty used to torture each other. Because that is their drive. That is their need. Their hunger is to torment and to cause pain and suffering as, as much as we want to eat. Mm-hmm. That's what they do. At some point, someone comes up with a brilliant idea of, instead of doing this to each other all the time, why don't we create something that we can all do this to, you know, get our venom out consequence-free. And that'll just be our, that'll be our industry. That'll be what we do, how we occupy ourselves and then we get to live in the uh, in the splendor of not being tortured all the time. That's mm-hmm. what we get out of it. Yeah. So they build a universe out around their universe, and that's our Earth, right? Metaphysically, Earth is hollow. It's built on top of hell, and it is literally like hell is low. As I mentioned in 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 uh, Heaven's Gate, hell is uh, is load bearing for Earth. Mm-hmm. Earth cannot exist without hell. You get rid of yeah. hell, Earth collapses. Yeah. The entire reason that Earth or humanity exists is simply as playthings for these beings of pure evil. Mm-hmm. That's the, that, is, that is the meaning of life. We exist to suffer for eternity. We are grown on the surface of the earth and then uh, so that we have, we grow so that we have fears. We have mm-hmm. personalities. We have wants. Because if we're nothing but impulse, we're not, interest, to we're not interested in torture. We'd be yeah. boring, right? Yeah. And so they cultivated this planet for billions of years until we got to the point that we were most entertaining but not powerful enough to do anything about it. What, we, what has happened over the course of our saga is we have reached this little threshold. We have crossed past this boundary where humanity is now potentially a threat and able to fight back and overthrow our masters. Mm-hmm. And that's the point where, okay, now we just turn off them. Now we just stop making new ones. We harvest the whole field, destroy the earth, and we start over. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's happened before. Maybe it's the 58th fucking time it's happened. Yeah. Yes, I fucking love The Matrix Reloaded, <laughs> right? Yeah. There's a reason why I chose the Wachowskis for that particular thing. And we've thing. become uh, increasingly efficient at it. Yes. Um, so that's my sort of thing. You know, maybe a lot of things derived from The Matrix. So what the death got, but the thing is that here on Earth, it's like us trying to exist underwater. You need vessels. You need human vessels, right? We're not built to live underwater or in outer space. Demons and God, even the gods, they're not meant to live in this earth. They can't mm. do it very long. 
So they don't, they're not going to do it until it's time to clean up shop. It's time to clean up shop. So here come the gods of death, the original architects of this world or their descendants. Doesn't really matter. We don't even need to have that specific information. Mm-hmm. The people who are in charge down there. Yeah. They're coming up now at risk to themselves, making themselves somewhat vulnerable because it's time to open the doors. Let's all have one last big orgy here on Earth where we get to torture them in their environment. Have a great time. It's okay because we're going to go because we're going to burn it down when it's done. Mm-hmm. Right. That's that's the hell on earth thing. That's what's that's what the goal is. Yeah, we're waking up. We're waking up our buddies. We're bringing them over here for one last big torture party before we have to start over and wait like forty billion years before the planet's ripe again. Mm-hmm. That's the that's the scheme. Yeah, that all scans for you, right? Yes, that all works. Cool. Um, I've been sitting on a lot of this for a year now. We haven't talked about how heaven fits into that. But okay. Before we do that, my one idea to sort of. I want to give a little bit more complexity to hell. Mm -hmm. And what I was thinking of as you were talking about this, so there's a short story collection that I read a few years ago uh, called Friday Black um, by Nana Kwame Ajay Brenya. I think I pronounced that right. Um, And the last story in it is called Through the Flash. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's about basically a neighborhood where a nuke has uh, struck. And the nuke strikes at sundown and somehow traps this neighborhood in a time loop. And they are now in a time loop of this one day, where at the end of the day, the nuke falls, and they wake up where they were that morning. The whole neighborhood is in this time loop, and over time, over centuries, they go through these phases of sometimes unimaginable cruelty, because everything gets undone, right? Mm -hmm. So it follows this like young girl who is feared by the entire neighborhood because for essentially centuries, she was the terror. She would show up and she would torture you all day and then you would wake up the next morning and she would do it again because there were no consequences to everything. I almost imagine what if hell was just like kind of like Earth until they unlocked immortality and maybe kind of like a climate change Earth. Like climate change was approaching the people in charge discovered immortality. They kept it for themselves, which is why the population is so small. And we ended up with this small population of people who couldn't die. And in their centuries of not dying, they turned to cruelty. And that just became their obsession. They gave into their base instincts mm-hmm. that they had already basically followed up on by letting the rest of the world die and just tortured each other and tortured each other. And the ones who were best at it rose to the top. They became the gods. They became the guys. And until they decided to expand and create Earth through some sort of magical mm-hmm. or scientific means or whatever. But that th- this was essentially earth prime until everyone until consequences disappeared and so they had to build a world with consequences Mm -hmm. they had to build an earth where people did die where people did uh not live forever and had wants and needs other than their base animal instincts so that they could torture them and it would be more fun and that gives just a little more than just like oh hell is hell and it's been like that way forever they're just creatures of hate and gives us more of a a little bit of a lineage i dig it i don't Um, know how much we spell this out in either movie i like that i have no idea if we'd get to any of it who knows but that does kind of make it more plausible that like is my idea of heaven and the angels is that this is the product of an of a rebellion that there Mm -hmm. were demons in hell who thought that the uh, oppression and torture of humanity, the idea of raising these beings just to make their lives horrible, yeah. and then they're, and then to torture them for all eternity as 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 uh, as eternal souls, uh, is evil, and they want to fight back, and so yeah. they stage a rebellion. The rebellion fails, but they manage to carve out a little a little pocket universe for themselves, which is heaven. Yeah, and then they have made occasional trips to try and do something, which is how the idea of heaven even becomes part of our lexicon. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, but we have everything backwards, right? Yeah. Our theology, most theologies in the world are based on the idea that there is a benevolent God mm-hmm. and then there's the, then there's the baddies, yeah. right? And they're not in charge. God's in charge. Like, no, nah, uh, nonsense. Yeah. If there's an interventionist God, this is the thing that I believe in real life. If there's an, <laughs> if there's an interventionist God, absolutely no way that he's benevolent or mm-hmm. he, they, she, whatever. That's, these two ideas are completely incompatible. Either there's You're a right. God. God is a they, she. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and she's evil. I am a, in, in all practical senses, in all truth and honesty, a complete agnostic. But one of the key things that keeps me agnostic is that I truly believe that any being 
that deliberately makes creates a world and demands worship. Any being that demands worship has immediately surrendered their right to be worshipped. They have they are inherently bad. Uh, if you're in the Discord, don't listen to that. You are right to worship us uh, with your dollars <laughs> and your attention, and uh, we are your benevolent gods. You, um, so, <laughs> so my, so I'm, I've become very fascinated with Maltheism as a, as a theological philosophy mm-hmm. in the last couple of years. Uh, starting, I don't know, somewhere around uh, November in 2016. I don't know. Um, <laughs> it just feels like if there's a God, he's not on our side. There's just, there's just no fucking way. Um, so I like the idea of building it that way, but I, I, I like the idea of good being a hopeless resistance against evil until something truly monumental changes. And who uh, knows if that'll happen. And who knows if that'll happen. Maybe uh, things are even darker in part four. <laughs> maybe we make, maybe there is no part four. Maybe we're yanking you. <laughs> and it just ends right here. Just ends right here. No, it doesn't. No. Uh, please keep listening. Um, there's more to come. Uh, but yeah, I think this gives us a good structure. Yes. We well, have to figure out sort of what our people are doing from place to place. We got to figure out where our set pieces are, mm-hmm. how the deaths happen, uh, how our heroes try to stay ahead of things and fail. Mm-hmm. But we have the carrot. We have we have the skeleton. We have the skeleton and the muscles. Yep. We got the skeleton of the plot. We got the character uh, motivation that's going to make it all move. Then we just got to make some sweet, sweet liquid skin and hope it lasts more than nine nine minutes because our story surely will. I really, that was the last episode we recorded. <laughs> uh, I really don't want our characters hunting for more artifacts. Yeah, let's not do that again. But we said that with House of Dracula and then we did it anyway. <laughs> um, but no, because I... Well, oh, they're being hunted. You resolve yeah. that problem with your structures. They're not going after things. They are They are the ones being, they're, they are the artifacts. for. Yeah. And, it, and it's funny, like we talk about how this is our Infinity War. We're not going to structure this story so that the uh, the baddies are the the protagonists like that. But it is sort of the thing where the villains are the ones who are on the fetch quest, and the things that are being fetched are our characters. It's a slasher movie. They're yeah. Michael Myers. Exactly. You know, our our characters are Laurie Strode and babysitters. Yeah. We simply need them to do. We need them to have something to do besides sit around and wait to be killed. Yeah. They, and they I have like to... the idea of trying to yes, trying to stay ahead of some crisis, mm-hmm. and maybe even. I think, you know, maybe they even do eke out a victory with one of these, right? Yeah. I think I think to have, there is no despair without hope, Dalton. Is there anything well, I right. learned from my mentor, Bane? Uh, <laughs> well, because also, I want to trick the audience. Yeah. I don't want the audience to know right away, oh, they're all dying. I think someone has to get a victory at some point so that maybe, I don't know if it's before Jack's death or after, but we have to... People need to think that Jack dying is an anomaly and not like, oh, so they're all dying. Yeah. You know, like we need, oh, this is just our act, end of act one motivating, you know, our inciting incident. Yeah. And is I think Jack that's another dying, reason you know? to keep Maria alive because then it makes it yes. feel like we've just promoted her, right? Yeah. Which we will have for yes. the space of about two hours. Yeah. So, the, yeah, there do need to be some victories. I think the Dark Legion can still sort of be chasing Set and Adelaide just trying to figure out where they're going to be next to try to stave off whatever mass extinction, you know, they're kind Mm -hmm. of uh, doing wherever they go. I'm trying to think there's any way in the world I can get Kill Your Darlings to to, to be involved in this. (laughs) I don't think so. No, that that happens in Hell on Earth. (laughs) Yeah, maybe. We'll We'll see. Gillian Anderson's character is the only surviving follower of Carmilla. If she was a follower. Well, I mean, they... They banged once. I don't know if they she maybe once. went back with her. I mean, you also, we haven't even talked about this. With the death of Carmilla, aside from theoretically the master, all vampires are dead. Yes. Um, it's the master and it's Maria. Yeah. And Maria kind of only sort of half counts. Yeah. I thought about making the master one of our gods of death, but I don't think... No. But if we were going to do that, the person he would kill would be Dracula. Yeah. Like, th- that's the thing. There's not like a, a thematic counterpart. I mean, unless he kills Maria as sort of his granddaughter, but I don't, I don't think so. No, I always kind of think of him as, I, I do imagine the character from, I think he's a demon or maybe a half yeah. demon. Plus we have- And I also don't want to explain what his deal is because it's more fun not to. Plus we cast a lot of people in uh, the mummy's hand as our death gods and yeah. we need to make sure we have enough to- fill out all those people. I don't know that I'm sold on the idea of them all being from these different pantheons. Uh, because I feel like, especially mm. the ones that we're not terribly familiar with, uh, it's it's sticky to do that and not be educated in, in, in the source material. Like, there's there's one you have on there that you, you know, we don't even know how to pronounce it. 
what like what is what is and there's also the thing with Hades, right? Where in American popular culture, we make Hades into a devil-like figure. Mm -hmm. But Hades is a much more complicated character in actual Greek mythology. It's not just, I am death and I'm evil, yeah. right? So that's the whole thing where we're, by using a bunch of those characters, I mean, this is an extension of having inherited set from the beginning of the story, right? But yeah, then the by thing, doing that, we are also, we are, we are adopting a bunch of baggage from centuries or millennia old text that we ain't got time to read. Yeah, but these are also comic book versions. It's like Marvel Comics Hercules. I mean, just like Set is. Set okay. isn't really tied to Egyptian mythology. And we can always say that like, well, those mythologies were born out of, you know, false understandings right. of who An these idea actual that we've sort of beings established, were, right? And know? I like, you know, you know, not all necessarily death, right? Like we have, we have the devil, we have Satan, right? And yeah. Satan isn't death, he's evil. Well, and that's why mostly, uh, I've either gone, like a lot, like, the Aztecs aren't around anymore. You know, sure. like that's, that's, uh, I mean, that's the same reason why we get to use Greek stuff and like all the Egyptian pantheons. Yeah. Like I'm kind of going, there for, aren't any present day believers in these icons. Yeah. And I think that's the same with, with the African one I, I chose. Like, I think these are more ancient. I think we should do research. Obviously we don't yeah. want to end up in like a case that we, you know, is common with like native American beings where it's like, Oh no, this is something that's like not talked about. Yeah. You know, but I, like, I just don't want to make the mistake of, and obviously our audience is pretty small, but let's not bet against ourselves for getting bigger and growing more international acclaim and whatnot. Yeah. I don't want to get a situation where we assume something is fair game because there is no one in our immediate circle to tell us it's not. Sure. Uh, I would, That's why I think we we do some research, but I think by sticking to mostly, it, like if one of these we find out like oh this is still something this is still someone that's worshipped or something. Uh -huh. Then we we pivot to something that is an extinct, you know, sort of mythology. Okay. Uh, Satan, I think, is the example because that's one we are well versed in. Yes, and I think and that's the kind of thing where because it's because it's part of the culture and the and the country in which we're raised, we're kind of allowed to be like, fuck it. Yeah, we get to do our version of Satan, which yeah. I think is is fun when we're dealing with like uh, mythological representations of death. You know, yeah. um, and Satan is the sort of Western Christian ruler of hell, uh -huh. you know? And so he should have a spot. You know, you know? I mean, I'm, Satan's the one I got least problem with, right? Yeah. Um, so I think that we have Really, to, there's uh, only two that we need. To, like, Hades, I think, is fair game. Yeah, you know? I spoke Disney did it, so we're fine. Yeah. Um, like, I think we just need to do our research on the Aztec, and I think it was Igbo. Is yeah. Maybe. I want to make sure also that they are each distinct enough that they will have uh, interesting individual set piece potential yes i want to give them their own yeah. looks their own kind of yeah how they dole out death mm -hmm. what their plague is that they unleash right you know? and, and, and the plagues can't i think if we're not if we're going to go beyond ancient egyptian and then abrahamic religions you know who, which famously sort of intersect in yeah. in masterful animated film the prince of egypt and nothing <laughs> else um i think we have to make sure that uh the, maybe that there's a sort of diversity in what the plagues are as well. That yeah. they are derived from those and not just picking things from the Passover story. No, I I, I was using plagues really just, just a shorthand. Okay. I don't think they should actually be plagues. I just mean that whenever one is awoken, there's some sort of mass death from a different cause. And yeah. it doesn't have to be like, we're not doing like locusts or whatever, but we can be like, we can be like, oh, there's a tidal wave. There's, you know, um, right. an earthquake or or just like people died in their beds. Like yeah. unexplained, one million people died in their beds, you know, mm -hmm. in this sort of radius yeah. of something happening. There's just some sort of right. I mean, I like death the idea takes of its toll. Being a mixture of things that are visually spe visually spectacular and terrifying, mm -hmm. things that are totally fantastical, things that are part of the the doom that we all are stressed about in climate change. Some yeah. things are just completely silent, sudden, inexplicable. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, and I don't all know. of it happens too fast for our heroes to do anything. Yes. And I feel like maybe they have the, they, they get enough information to get ahead of one of them so mm -hmm. they can meet it at the climax of the film. Yeah. And maybe win, right? Maybe they prevent one of those. And while they're preventing it, two more have happened. Or it, it, they prevent it and it doesn't matter because the door opens anyway. Right. You know? I mean, I, mean, I guess we kind of want to reproduce that moment where it's God, I feel so lazy constantly going back to Infinity War, but that is this that is part of the mandate of our show that we're kind of <laughs> thing. There's that there's 
you know, you have you have the you have the moment where all the the Guardians of the Galaxy and Thor they arrive on there. It's this huge fuck yeah WrestleMania mm-hmm. moment, and remember in theaters people jumped out of their seats. Yep. Um, and then you have Thor planting his fucking axe in uh in Thanos's chest, and you think for half a second, if you're not you know super wise to the release schedule of these films in advance, <laughs> uh oh hey. They did it. They won. No, no, you should have gone for the head, motherfucker. Mm-hmm. We got more movies to make. Yeah. Uh, so if we can create... And that can be Jenny's hero moment, yeah. right? Jenny has a hero moment where she gets a little bit of redemption Yeah. by maybe she's the one that prevents whatever tragedy this is. We could even... And maybe, then Aminette kills her. Maybe one of the gods of death can be expendable. Maybe we can kill one. Maybe, maybe we can open the possibility that one of them can be killed. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess, and the idea of the way that you would kill Set, right? Because we have we have a blueprint for this. Killing Set was accomplished by killing Set's vessel when mm-hmm. he was vulnerable. That goes all the way back to the mummy, and they were few, and they you know time and time again they didn't do it. You know who would be really easy for Jenny to kill? Fucking Set. <laughs> it's too soon for Set, but the thing is that the person who 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 would be the most cathartic for Jenny to kill would be the one that is living in Adelaide's body. But Dracula is going to kill but, Adelaide. But oh, that's right. All right. Okay. But that also gives us the possibility that we know that one of them can die. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we could we could kill Set, and then Aminette's the big bad in Dark Legion Four. We could, and that would be satisfying in some way in closing our loop. And Roxanne would love it. Yes, that's true. <laughs> it let the individual very active members in our Discord. <laughs> we'd love to shout out. I don't know why I, I want to put this out there because I I uh, I don't know how I got this in my head. Because it makes what you're saying is obviously what we were talking about, but somehow I had it in my head that when the way that we find out that Dracula is returning is that when he bursts through that door, he runs his sword through Jenny, and that's how she dies. Hmm. Just because as a visual, I find that to be very shocking and captivating, but it doesn't make as much sense. It doesn't make as much sense because I, what I like about Dracula killing Adelaide is he is eliminating the Van Helsing line. Uh huh. He made the deal with Pazuzu. Uh, it which is, it is the thing he's been trying to do throughout the entire Dracula in hell. Actually, thing. you know what? That makes me his whole thing is that he needs to kill Nick, Adelaide, and Set. Uh huh. He comes through the door, kills Adelaide and Set in mm-hmm. one go. Yes. Which means even though he teams up with Nick, we know through all of Dark Legion Four that he also needs to kill. Okay, Nick. that's good because once again, maybe this gets cut out because it's <laughs> talking about the next movie. And I know I can sell this to you because even though what my point of reference for this is the ending of Metal Gear Solid 4, which you haven't played, it also is a lot like the ending of Lost, oh. where I want either after or alongside whatever grand climax that we have mm-hmm. for it to be a very small, bloody, hand-to-hand fucking brawl between Nick and Dracula alone. Well, there we go. That's yes. why, because Dracula needs to kill Nick in yeah. order to get his uh, vampire powers. Right, because what Dracula wants is the status quo, essentially, that we had at the beginning of this series, but with mm-hmm. himself on top. Yeah. And what the heroes, surviving heroes and such, are trying to do is, you know, not that. But he's willing to go along with it. Nobody knows, except for us in the audience, what Dracula really wants. We can make sure to remind them in some sneaky way. Uh, probably sneakier than, like, having Gollum speak to his reflection at the beginning and at the, at the end of Two Towers and beginning of Return of the King to remind us what his deal is. I think what we do is during Set and Aminette's adventures, at whatever point we do understand the full plan, uh-huh. Set sort of promotes Aminette to God of Death. Through and- marriage. For ma- through marriage, yeah. yeah. They maybe they have a wedding. Mm-hmm. Aminette becomes a god of death, which is why she's the one to take Jenny. Mm-hmm. That's how maybe that's how they like sort of consummate it. She needs a body. Well, well and she sh- has a body. Well, and she needs to do it to open Death's door anyway. Right. That's, yeah. Any you know, all these gods need to. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, oh, oh! Do they promote her because one of them is slain? Yes, that's what I was just thinking. Yeah, they successfully kill one of the gods of death, and so it doesn't. Take, it comes for Jenny and can't get her, but they still need the same number of people killed to open the door. Uh-huh. So Set promotes Aminette through marriage. The number is six, right? Yes. Should be. It should be. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's six. So they promote so Aminette gets promoted to Death God. So now she's the one to take Jenny. Dracula comes through the door, kills Adelaide and Set, but because Adelaide bore the mark, that's still enough marks. Uh, oh. eliminated to open the door. Okay. But Aminette 
is the one who at the end opens the door instead of said. Mm -hmm. Aminette is the one who now is on top. Right. And by in the act of opening the door, she sort of has, if 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 in no other way but symbolically established, uh, I am the captain now. Yes. Uh no, I love it. And I I like the idea that I really like having her be the the final villain. But I definitely want to spend some time and I'll I'll happily take this stuff on because I, yeah. I want to do it with the mythology and I also like the idea of playing with with Aminette more. Because you had your shot, Dalton. <laughs> yes, and you yeah, made her secondary. Um, yeah, I want to. I want to handle that subplot. Great, and then I will find another death god that we can kill uh-huh. to give our characters an act two victory that throws us off, throws the listener off the scent of this being an everyone dies slasher. Oh, maybe we got Hella in the mix. That we, we don't actually, have anybody. Hella, Hella was was a consideration. Maybe we kill Hella, mm-hmm. and then Do we have anything. And again, I'm talking we about. Think the would tide we like is to appropriate turning. anything Asian for this because we don't have that continent covered yet? Uh, we could look. We could look because yeah, we don't have we don't have uh the Asian continent covered. But that's also where I'm going to feel most out of my depth. Okay, uh, and me too. Of, yeah, we might have to seek higher powers on these topics. Um, without. From outside our Discord community. Yeah. <laughs> so that we but I think Hella it. also works as Hella is very uh popularly sure. known. And Hella going after Jenny would be fun. Yeah. Um, um we need to cast somebody. Do you have any thoughts? Can't be Kate Blanchett. We we I mean, our thing with the Death Gods is that they've all been kind of horror legends, right? Uh-huh. Um, like I think Tony Todd should be our, our voice of Un Oh, oh, yeah, um, no, I think yeah. That that's that's natural. Yeah. yeah, we've got, uh, of course, the voice of uh, we've got John Kassir, the voice of uh, Tales from the Crypt guy. Uh huh. Wait, he was set, right? He's set. Yeah, he's set's voice. Um, but we had um, uh, Doug, Doug Bradley, Bradley in the mix and Brad Dourif. Ooh, Doug Bradley should be Hades. Yes, Doug like Bradley that. is Hades. Brad Dourif can be Satan. Oh yeah, he'd love that. Brad Dourif perfect. is Satan. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But we need a uh, female horror legend mm-hmm. whom we have not used yet in, yeah. in this to play uh, to play Hella, somebody who has that kind of legacy and that kind of history, and specifically as a not not necessarily a scream queen, someone who's been a monster, mm. um, which is harder because there aren't as many big iconic. I'm guessing the actress that played Jason's mom is dead. I would assume. Because she's like the OG female slasher. Sure. We can figure out someone off the air. We will, yeah. Uh, But I think this is a great place for us to start scripting. Um, This gives us a lot to to chew on. We have the cold open written already. We do. Um, And we know how how it ends. I also think this might end up a little leaner than Mummy's Hand because it's a much slimmer horror like we don't have to have everyone globe chasing right. artifacts and the cast and, is yeah. getting smaller rather than bigger yes which our, is our cast is smaller and it's going to slim down as we go yes uh this might end up being a, a a more lean and mean dark legion oh it'll be meaner for sure yes oh boy oh. uh we hope you still I'm, like us i'm really excited to i'm really excited to write this i have never been more afraid of uh, the fan reaction to something that I have done in any medium at any time. They're going to love it. I mean, again, we have the fact that our process is large part of the product. Um, and, and the story's not over. And the story's not over. I know the story's not over. I will say no more. Please hang on with us. We've got some fun, including some goofy stuff in our palate cleanser portion. Um, we need some some time to work out your fan theories and... Uh, and think about uh, what what hell on earth might look like. We'll explore that status quo over pretty thoroughly over the next uh, the next four of our uh, canon episodes. We'll have guests in between. I was thinking if we can think this far ahead, it would be fun if when Death Store opens and Hell on Earth is unleashed, we have like a little bit of a montage and we cut to scenes from like just sort of precursors to our four intermediary movies maybe it's hard because one of mine has such a is, is such a goofy premise uh i don't know if i want to undercut the tone i'm but, but you it could be as simple as demons running through a cornfield okay you know works. like just something that hints at the, yeah. the coming movies no, that's fine with me um, um so they don't feel so detached i guess yeah um and then in the middle of that if all goes according to plan they'll have uh, a nice little piece of levity in the next Dark Legion holiday special. Yes, we'll definitely have... Uh, Which I imagine point. we would set before this. Probably. It might be fun to do a holiday special set in the middle of it. Who's gonna be in it? Uh, not the Dark Legion. Okay, well, we'll figure <laughs> that out later. I know I have a title that it's I really Nick like. It's Nick and Dracula having a nice, cozy Christmas <laughs> together. I have a title that I like. I think we talked about it. 
Yeah. Um, that I guess does not necessarily require the Dark Legion, but I thought that might be thought it might be nice to have a little, or maybe it'd just be too sad. I don't no, know. No, it might be good to go back and do like a uh this happen. This yeah, takes way we place get another Dark story with the characters before they're all depressed and dead. I mean, there were two years between. Like, we can go back to when Evelyn was still alive. Yeah, there we was can a do the Christmas after the last holiday special. Yeah. I think that uh, makes sense. That would be nice. Uh, I think that that might be something to bring in a little little levity to the proceedings. In just a few months. Yes. Oh, God. We've got a lot of work ahead of us. All right. Well, we love you all. Thanks for bearing with us. Thank we you hope so much. this uh, illuminated our process for you a little bit. Maybe you're less mad at us now. Maybe you're more mad at us. And until next time, stay, stay afraid. afraid. Hold on. The... Sign up for the Patreon. Patreon.com slash Dylan and Dalton. We yes, have, please. We're, we're, we have lots of fun By stuff. By this point, you've heard a lot about the new Patreon tiers uh, and the new stuff we have happening on the fucking bonus pod, which is super fun. Oh, and I don't know exactly what date this comes out, but I have a new single out called Hell Breaks Loose. And, and here it is. Cool new visit. <laughs> no, I've already played it on the show that's at right. this point. Yes. Uh, but either it's a single for an EP that's either already out or probably coming out like this week. So... I'll probably be talking about it all over social media, but please listen to that EP. It rocks. Um, maybe you heard a song from it in this episode. I don't know. We're recording this so far in advance. I can't plan for these things, <laughs> uh, but I do have new music. Uh, sign up for the Patreon. And then until next time, stay, stay afraid, afraid of, of the, the dark, dark universe. universe. We love you. 